I'd like to talk to you this morning about a topic that's probably the most important topic facing not only our planet, but most, if not all, of humanity. And that is, how are we going to feed a growing population all over the world in a sustainable manner with nourishing food? I'm going to come at this question from the perspective of a physician, an endocrinologist, working within the food and beverage industry, trying to tackle this question from a global perspective. Let me start by first posing two questions. Why do we process food? And second, what is it that our tongues could actually teach us about how to process food according to our whole body's needs? Let's take the first question. Why do we process food? We've already heard conversation around this, but let's go back in history and ask ourselves, when did we start doing this? Many historians have argued that agriculture marked the dawn of human civilization. Yet what do we do with the output of that agriculture? We took the harvest, we stored it, and then we made it available to everybody all year round, hoping that all the nutrients would be retained until the next harvest. And of course, the harvest occurred in about two to three weeks, and the remainder 50 weeks, we had to have it available. We learned to store food first. That is what allowed our species to grow and survive. In fact, one of the earliest foods we learned to actually cook was to take grains. That's why they're so ubiquitous in just about every culture on the planet. We took those grains, we ground them, we added water, added yeast, added heat, and we called that baking, and we made it into bread. When we bake bread to scale, we call it processing today. The process really hasn't changed. However, the scale significantly has. And let's elaborate on this in a minute. Now, let's fast forward and ask ourselves what the challenge is. Agriculture today accounts for 80% of the global use of clean water. It is the single largest source of greenhouse gases. What has happened? Well, let's take a look at the world's population in 1804. There were one billion humans on the face of the Earth. Most of those humans lived in rural areas in close proximity to where they grew their food. They actually consumed most of the food that they grew themselves, something that we still talk about. Let's now move forward 200 years. The population today of the world is 7 billion people. Half of those people now live in cities. Many of those cities are large cities. In fact, there are 20 cities on the planet that have a population in excess of 10 million people. Most of those cities are actually in the developing world. There are only two in the developed world, London and New York. Let's move forward another 40 years to the year 2050. By the year 2050, there will be 9.5 billion people on the planet. The majority will live in cities. Most of those will be mega cities. And what is the implication of this for the food industry and for our food supply? Let's just think about this. By the year 2050, there will be 7 billion people living in cities. That is equal to the total population of the planet today. That is happening as we speak. So there is an irreversible urbanization that has gone on that will continue. Imagine a city with 30 million people. That's what we have to work to. Now, what is the implication? Well, very simply, think about this problem. The majority of people, the 7 billion people living in these cities, and most of the food is grown at some remote location in a rural area far from where the people are. As a result, we're going to have to harvest this food, store it, process it, distribute it, and make it available equally to every human on the planet 
so that it is nourishing, is produced in a sustainable manner, and it tastes good. Oh, by the way, we've made a lot of progress in agriculture, and yet there are one billion people who go to sleep every night today hungry. There are over a billion people that are overweight or obese. It sets up two significant issues, one around quantity of food, the other around quality of food. There is an issue of mismatch of the distribution of food, and the other is the quality of that food. And I'm going to touch on both. Let's touch on quantity first. Are we producing enough food today? Well, let's think about it. 40% of all food that's produced and harvested today is wasted because it is lost from our food supply. The cause of that loss depends on where you are on the planet. If you're in the developing world, it's lost because there's inadequate distribution and storage capacity. And in the developed world, it's after it gets to the consumer. It's lost from our kitchens and it's lost from our restaurants. If we could save just one third of this lost food today, just one third, we would be able to feed every man, woman, and child that one billion people that go to bed hungry every night. That's all it would take. And if we could save all of it, we could provide humanity with enough food to last us to meet the nine and a half billion people we need to the year 2050 with not one more ounce of food that needs to be produced with no further impact on the planet. Do we know how to do that? Perhaps. Let me talk on that. So, as we think about the answers to this challenge, the quantity side might be able to be addressed. There are many issues into this, and I'm not going to elaborate any further. But let's now talk about the quality of this food. How might we understand better to meet the needs of the human being? And there are some surprising developments going on in science that I want to just touch on one aspect. Surprising ways in which we're starting to understand our body. Let's think about this. And that raises the second question. What is it that our tongues could actually teach us about our bodies? This might seem surprising in, on, on the surface because we've always been taught and learned that taste is a sensory phenomenon. We put something in our mouth. If it's sweet, we enjoy it. If it's bitter, we don't like it. It's a very simple linear process. But yet, even yesterday, we heard that biology is rarely, if ever, linear. There are integrate networks and connections in our bodies that are unraveling and giving us clues as we speak. I'm just going to elaborate on just one aspect of this. In order to do that, let's take a look, and I'm going to share with you two observations. The first, take a young, healthy athlete, ask that athlete to put something sweet in their mouth and then spit it out. Not swallow it, not ingest it, spit it out. And then ask them to get on a bicycle and ask that ex individual to exercise. And guess what happens? What we'll observe is that athlete can exercise longer and with greater intensity just by the mere fact that they put something sweet in their mouth. They didn't swallow it, didn't get into their body, didn't provide them with more calories. What is the implication of this? It suggests that the activation of taste in your mouth somehow signal the muscles to change the way in which they perform. Well, what is the signal? How is the tongue communicating with the muscle? What is the message? How is the cell in the muscle changing its metabolism? It suggests there's a connection. Let me share the second observation that adds further light onto this. We sense taste through taste buds. The molecules within our taste buds that experience and sense this taste have now been identified not only in our mouths, but recently in our guts, and even more recently in the endocrine cells within our pancreas. Let me remind everybody, the pancreatic endocrine cells are those cells that release insulin, the most powerful and critical hormone necessary for energy balance and metabolism. What is the implication of this? It suggests that, in fact, our taste system is not just a sensory system, but it's critical to regulation and metabolism. 
It doesn't just exist there for our brains to enjoy, but for our bodies to regulate. So what does that mean from a food point of view and availability of the types of foods? Well, it suggests, because since it starts in the mouth, there must be something in our food that's activating these cells and these sensing molecules, not only in terms of taste, but it comes with the food. Very simply stated, nature has put into our food supply not only the nutrients and nourishment that we need to sustain our bodies, but likely has put into it the instructions with which we understand how to metabolize that food. The whole food. Come together, we have nutrients and instructions that we co-ingest. Ah, what does that mean? It means that the system that is around sensing also is around interacting with our regulation. And in fact, our food and our bodies interact in far more profound ways than just providing us nourishment, but actually in a sensing, signaling, regulatory mechanism. Our food gives us instructions. But when we process food, do we know if we kept those instructions in there? Or did we process them out? Or if we process them in, do we know we retained them when we stored them? And of course, one option here is that we just go out and just consume whole fruits and vegetables. Everybody should do that. Absolutely no disagreement. But if you have 7 billion people today and 9.5 billion tomorrow, and we're not meeting their needs today, there is no way this planet can sustain the amount of water and land it's going to take if we do not create efficient ways of growing food, it will not happen on the rooftop of a 60-story building. Not for everybody who lives in that building. We're going to have to figure this out. And we're going to do it together, as I'll talk about. So imagine the future and the food that this might give us. It would have the protein of an egg, the fiber of whole grains, the calcium of milk, the fruit of a whole fruit, all the nourishment in a sustainable package, tastes delicious, available to us wherever we are in the world. It's accessible and it's produced in a sustainable manner. So our planet is healthy and we're healthy. I don't know what that food looks like, but it sounds like the perfect breakfast. Could we make it? Well, let me throw out a challenge. And that challenge is, can we take all agricultural products, can we create new ways of processing by understanding not only our planets and our infrastructure needs, but our body's needs? And out of that, can we be sustainable not only from a planet point of view, but sustainable from a health point of view? And meet everybody's needs. This is not just our right as Americans, but everybody on the planet. Just because we can buy it doesn't mean, say, we need, who should go out and deplete other parts of the world. We need to do it in a sustainable manner. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pose a challenge to everybody. Everybody in this room, what will it take for the right experts to come together? Government, academics, scientists, agriculturists. But let me share one fact with you. 98% of the world's food today is either completely or portly bought by every human being on the planet. 98% of all humans buy it from the private sector. No governments make food. No academics make food. If we're going to do this, we're going to do this together. So my challenge to you all is, what will it take to bring the right players together, take the barriers away so we can have the conversations and understand what it will take from our collective expertise to answer probably the greatest challenge facing humanity. And I face to you three issues today. One, processing has been with us ever since we've been civilized. However, it has been critical to our survival and will be even more critical to sustain 9.5 billion people on the planet or the 7 billion today. Second, if we're going to learn to process food even better, we're going to have to learn new methodologies, new techniques, new science. And in order to do this, we're going to have to have conversations between areas of expertise that have traditionally never talked to each other. Whether it's molecular biologists and taste and science, agriculture, government, regulation, and ultimately process engineering. 
And of course, it can be done. Failure is not an option. The third I suggested to you were examples between the relationship between our body and taste. And of course, Einstein knew this 50 years ago when he posed for this. Thank you very much.